I would like to thank our distinguished guests for taking the time to educate us in this important topic. Thank you to the Honorable Allie Greenleaf, Maldonado, John Marceau, and Stacy Rock. I hope we will get a full bio on you in just a moment. And I'd also like to thank Professor Vestran for moderating, moderating this panel. I actually heard um, Professor Vestran and our, our esteemed panelists talking about this a couple of weeks ago, and I learned so much just in their little practice. I cannot wait to see what happens today. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. If you haven't already seen it, please take time to watch the PBS documentary, Warrior Lawyers, Defenders of Sacred Justice, which examines contemporary Native American nation rebuilding through the personal stories of Native attorneys, tribal judges, and their colleagues. The documentary provides an overview of the major historical, legal, judicial, and intertwining social issues shaping many federally recognized Native Americans today and reveals how culture and traditional values are effectively being utilized to face challenges and promote sacred justice. The documentary will educate an audience of Native and non-Native viewers about the evolving narrative of American Indians and how their traditions and values can benefit mainstream society as well. If you haven't seen it, you really should invest the time. Uh, the link is up on Cooley Connect. Once again, welcome everyone, and I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Vestrand. Thank you very much, President McGrath. And yeah, it is my privilege to serve as the moderator of that, what I think is a very um, significant event and um, an honor as well, simply because I am for Native American peacemaking. I had the um, very good fortune of having the opportunity to train in peacemaking under the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, uh, a tribe that's very near to where I have summered my entire life. So I deeply have value those relationships and what I've learned from uh, the tribe. And I'm just so pleased that we've got these three esteemed panelists here today to help us understand better some of the issues that are raised in the documentary uh, that President McGrath referred to. And I would second his recommendation that if you haven't watched it, you really should. Um, it's very eye opening um, and I think has some important information for lawyers and law students. I think the best place to start would be uh, rather than myself speaking about each of our panelists to let them talk about their journey to law school and why um, they decided to become a lawyer. So if each of our panelists, and I'm going to start with uh, you, Judge Maldonado, could tell us uh, your tribe affiliation and why you chose law school and what have you done with your degree, if, if, if that would be a nice way to begin. Ani, askebagash gigido indinakas, waganakasing odao kwe, Mashike and Dorum. I just introduced myself to you in the Odawa language to invite my ancestors to be here with us in a good way. Um, my name is Allie Greenleaf Maldonado, and it's my great honor to serve my community as chief judge for the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. And we're located, we often get mixed up with the Grand Traverse Band. We're actually located right here, if you're looking at the, the mitten. Um, on Lake Michigan in Petoskey and Harbor Springs in the Charlevoix area there. Um, I went to law school because I'm the first generation in my family to not be removed because of the official government policy of Indian removal of their children. For over 100 years, the federal government, in an effort to make Native Americans Christian and to um, assimilate them into the broader society, had an official government policy of removing as many Indian children as possible from their families, homes, and communities and placing them in non-Indian boarding schools. Um, that was their first iteration. And then later on, it was into uh, foster care, non-Indian foster care and other kinds of placements. Um, my mother was removed, my grandmother was removed, all my uncles were removed, and I am located right here in near the last boarding school that was closed. And these are federally funded schools in the United States, and it closed in the 1980s. 
And so many people don't even know um, that this happened in this country, but it impacted literally everyone in my community. And I think I could speak for all the panelists. We all, um, you know, there's not one person in my community that was not impacted by this policy, by the boarding schools. And so for me, I saw what it did to my family, and that's why I applied to go to boarding or to a law school and was very fortunate. I graduated from the University of Michigan Law School. Um, I was on the law review. I graduated in the top third of my class. And from there, I went on to be a litigator in the highly competitive honors program at the United States Department of Justice. And I was in the Environment and Natural Resources Division in the Indian Law Section. And after some time there, uh, I worked at a law firm as a registered lobbyist. That was not for me. I, I appreciate the fact that we need good Native people uh, lobbying for laws that are good for our community, uh, but that's not that's not where I fit into the the picture. And I figured that out pretty fast. Um, and then I thought that I'd be older and wiser, maybe you know, maybe at this point in my life when I came back and and worked directly for my community. But the minute I graduated from law school. The tribe started calling me monthly, asking me to come home and work for my community. So um, after some time, I acquiesced and I joined as in-house uh, the assistant general counsel for my tribe, where I worked for nine years before taking the bench in 2012. So that was my journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. John? I'm John Morse on Dejnikaz. Border water mean that I'll take a neck in Bendagwas, the Wajak, I guess, uh, Rhode Island right now, at Diane, um, or Boston. Um, but I'm uh, John Morsa. I'm the uh, former treasurer uh, for the Okagan Band of Potawatomi. I am, I took a, a new position as a tribal relations lead for a Orsted, which is a sustainable energy company out here on the East Coast. And so mine would be much shorter than Judge Maldonado's um, because I um, have not had as, as, as illustrious career. But uh, my I went to law school primarily because uh, I just knew that throughout history that tribes would get the short end of the stick and a lot of the uh, Cases, a lot of the uh, the negotiations, just a lot of of uh, seemed like there was an uneven power dynamic, and, and you know, I say was, but there still is. <laughs> and I wanted to to do what I could to um, learn the law and help even out those uh, those power dynamics. Uh, growing up, the the um, analogy that I make is that the uh, when you're playing a board game, like the person who knows how the rules of the game usually does the best in the game. And that is, uh, you know, so you need to know the rules of the country and hopefully you'll do better. And so that was my mentality going to law school at the time there, and there's still not a lot of native attorneys. So I also wanted to contribute to, to um, that population and make sure we can get representation in, you know, places where it's very important. A lot of our lawmakers are attorneys, right? They go to law school. And if they go to law school with native students, then they might see them more than just mascots. They might see them more than just these crazy, you know, or weird populations of people that live by themselves and do weird Indian things, right? Uh, so I wanted to, you know, just being aware, right? Being out there, interacting, getting to to um, rub elbows and go to school with the people who will be in you know, positions of power in the future uh, will, you know, further further us uh, along and help progress uh, Native views uh, in, a, in a kind of an indirect way, but I, I think uh, in a meaningful way. And so those are my motivations for going to law school. I uh, had no idea even how to get to law school. I, I started up community college and I walked in the guidance counselor's office and said, I want to go to law school. What do I need to do? And they said, we got to go to uh, take political science pre-law, which I found out was not accurate, right? You can, you can take anything. Uh, don't know what I would have taken if, uh, or minored in, or majored in, if I would have gone to law, maybe something in, or, uh, or in political science, maybe something in uh, 
statistics or finance. But um, so that's where I went uh, and then graduated. I uh, went to uh, university of, after graduating from Michigan State University. I clerked for a year uh, at the Pagan Band uh, Travel Court under Stacy, trained me. Stacy uh, trained me after I graduated. Um, worked a, a year there and then went to the University of Mex New Mexico School of Law because that particular legal program with their uh, native studies or their federal Indian law program has graduated a lot of native attorneys, right? Just a sheer volume of native attorneys because they were an earlier adopter of that program. Uh, judge Potosky, who's uh, Chief Judge Potosky, who's at the Chief Judge for the Pagan Banner, uh, went to New Mexico and a lot of other attorneys I respected went there. So that's where I, I chose to go. And I didn't want to spend all of my education in Michigan. So I needed to, to leave the country or leave the state <laughs> um, for a few years and then came back and and did more of like a judicial clerk at the Pokagon Band Tribal Court and then went to work for the Michigan Indian Legal Services, uh, doing legal services, legal aid with the unrepresented or un, underrepresented low income uh, native native people in Michigan. And then I ran for tribal council and was elected right during COVID actually, and uh, and used my legal skills in, in that arena to help with the understanding the laws that apply to tribes, not necessarily in the, the um, in-house council position, but a legal education is just um, good for a lot of leadership roles. And so I, I use it in that regard. And now I'm taking those experiences and using them as a tribal relations manager. So you don't, you, know, you can benefit Native communities without practicing directly um, in Native communities in house council for a tribe or, or in that, you know, what we can what we consider like traditional type of legal practice. So, miigwech. Thank you. Stacy, who happens to be a current Cooley student uh, finishing up, is the assistant court administrator and the clerk of the court for the Pokagon Band. Uh, Stacy. Bonjour, Stacy Rock and Dijnikas, Mushike and Dodo, Pokagan Band in Dabadaguas, Bodwe Wadmi and Dow, Covert Michigan in Dochbia, Odopi Casopolis in Deda. Um, my name is Stacy Rock. I'm Turtle Clan. I'm enrolled with the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi. Um, I come from Covert Michigan, but I currently live in Casopolis. Um, I actually just graduated from Cooley last Thursday. Um, so happy to be back and sharing some of my knowledge with my uh, peers and fellow alumni and whoever else may be watching. Um, I guess for me, my journey to law school was probably a whole lot different than um, some others. Um, I, I've known since second grade that I wanted to be a lawyer. I remember, uh, we had to do a project and it was for black history month and I did mine on Thurgood Marshall and I wanted to be just like him. Uh, and ever since then, I, you know, I've kind of known, but, um, my journey to get there took a lot longer. Right. Um, so once I graduated high school, I attended Davenport University and took paralegal studies. Um, when I was, a, I don't know, it was 11 years ago, I started here at the Polkagan Tribal Court as a clerk. Um, and, uh, the more I did that while, uh, earning my bachelor's degree, um, in paralegal studies and. The more I worked for the court, the more that I learned, the more that I um, had the opportunity to work with other attorneys that come to our court. Um, some who knew very little about tribes, the more I was inspired to become an attorney for our children, for our people, um, especially when I would get several calls a week asking about how our things worked here. And I'm like, why am I not a lawyer if I'm if I'm telling people how the things work here? Um, John can probably speak to that a little bit. So about um, four, four and a half years ago, um, 
I applied to Cooley and um, obviously got accepted, went to school there while maintaining my full-time job here at the Polk Kagan Band. Um, also been involved with our uh, tribal school board here. Um, Currently, we only have like a early childhood development center, um, but uh, it's it's a start. Um, and then also been on the American Indian Law section um, for the State Bar of Michigan. Um, so while uh, Cooley doesn't necessarily um, at this time offer a whole lot of Native American studies, um, I found my way to stay uh, like in those discussions and in those arenas in addition to what I do at work. Um, I haven't done much with my law degree since I just got it like five days ago. <laughs> um, but right now the, the plan is to just kind of uh, stay where I'm at and um, I'm gonna be taking a sabbatical to study for the bar exam coming up. And I, I just want to continue to um, be able to give back to my tribe and my people. Uh, like John mentioned, there are various different capacities in which you can um, assist tribes, whether that's um, being an outside private attorney that um, is a guardian ad litem for your children or um, assist with like criminal and civil type cases, um, whether that's in-house counsel or within the court system, um, whatever I find myself doing from there, I know that I'll continue to work for my tribe and uh, with my people or with other tribes in the state or in the nation. Um, I'm very adamant about um, various policy issues and I'm working on some things with the uh, Indian law section of the state bar currently. So, um, and obviously anything that I can do to give back to my wonderful school. So uh, that's kind of well, where I'm you. at right now. <laughs> thank you and, and congratulations to you and best wishes on the bar exam. You mentioned um, policy issues of concern, you know, I don't know how many people are aware that we do have 12 federally recognized tribes here in Michigan. And I think, John, I heard you say that that might be turning into 13, possibly. Um, what is the Native American population in Michigan, uh, if, 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 if any of you know? Just... Yeah, we have, so Michigan has the largest Native American population east of the Mississippi River with 12 federally recognized tribes. We have um, over 100,000 native people located in the state of Michigan. And we actually have one a bustling urban Indian population with about 50,000 native people located in the Lansing, Detroit, Macomb County area. Um, I also want to take note of how special it is you have this young lady graduating from this law school right now. There are only, uh, in the last sentence, only about 5 million people identified themselves as Native American in this country. And out of that, give or take 5 million, there were only about, there are only about 2,600, 2,600 Native American attorneys in the entire country. And she is graduating from your law school joining those ranks. It warms my heart. Uh, I, I can't speak to the total. I mean, obviously, Judge Mullins not know, know that much better. <laughs> the, uh, but from Pokagon Band, we're one of the larger tribes in, in Michigan, and we have about um, 6,000 members, uh, citizens. So, um, I can only speak to, to that. I haven't, I don't know the demographics of the whole state. Yeah. Why, why do you think that there are only 2,600 Native American lawyers in the United States? I can speak to that. It's hard. <laughs> well, it, it not, not just that law school is hard, but 
for instance, like for myself, I'm not only the first person in my, not just my immediate family to graduate from law school, I'm the first person to graduate from college. Um, and not only that, but like, yes, tribes have different um, support systems and, and there, there are various scholarship opportunities, but I'm gonna debunk the fact right now that every Indian goes to, to college for free, because that's a myth. Um, in Michigan, there is a Michigan Indian tuition waiver, but that only applies if you go to a public school. So for me, I not only had to care for my two children, um, I do a lot for not only my family, but my community, as well as work a full-time job and attend law school. And not a whole lot of people are built like that. Um, it, and I'm not trying to like toot my own horn or anything, but it's hard, you know? And you have to have a lot of support, um, not just financially, but, um, and then a lot of our people, you know, when you can't, ha when you're not having your day to day um, needs met, housing, food, um, transportation, when those things aren't being met on a consistent basis, you can't even think about higher education because you're gonna th you're gonna be thinking about where you're gonna get your next meal, where you're gonna sleep. Um, so, you know. And, and not only that, but a lot of our people are tied to their cultural things. Um, and and that doesn't that doesn't require a higher education to to go and learn your language or your cultural and cultural things and practice those things. Those aren't things that you can learn in a classroom. Um, I mean, we could talk about them here, but you really have to be immersed in that environment. And those are just as valuable as any law degree. And I think we'll talk about that when we get to the aspects of peacemaking. But I'll let the others tune in. So for me, when I was growing up, the idea of going to law school was audacious. Not only did I not know even one Native American lawyer, never mind a Native American judge, I didn't even know a Native American person in a seat of authority that was like the boss anywhere. And so the idea that I could go to law school was simply, uh, I mean, audacious is really the best word for it. And I remember when I was talking to my academic advisor who was helping me apply, uh, by the way, I got a business degree, so <laughs> no political science for me, but, uh, she asked me why I wanted to go to law school and I put my head down and my eyes were on the floor and I very quietly said, well, I'd like to be a judge. And with warmth and sincerity and support, uh, she said, you would make a wonderful Supreme Court judge. And I looked up at her with big wide eyes and I was like, I was thinking traffic court. Uh, but the idea that I could come and serve my community or any community as a judge, uh, I was making this up out of thin air. So hopefully as there's more people like John um, and, and myself and our other panelists out there in the world with law degrees and other Native people can see that, perhaps then we'll have more people inspired to go to law school. Yes, that's a that's a good point about the uh, it starts at a very young age because native students don't graduate high school at large, you know, at you know at, at the same rates as other other uh, groups, and that contributes. And then if you're not graduating or excelling academically at the same rate as other groups, then you're not selected for further encouragement to, to pursue these types of uh, additional pathways, right? No one's gonna single you out and be like, oh man, you did really good at um, writing or the debate team. Like, you know, no one's gonna take a C student and be like, oh, you're the, you're it, right? Like you gotta, you gotta go to law school. Um, and that, you know, I was a C student in school. Um, I think I graduated like a 2.7 or something from Dwajak. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I went to 
did better when I was in college and then did really well in law school. And it's just like, there are, you know, there, there are a lot of factors that, that start out at that age. And then as, as a, both judge and Stacy mentioned that when you, uh, like, and then I experienced when you, yeah, when you even like say that you want to go to law school, you try to find people to assist you. You don't get the right advice. You don't get the right guidance. No one's done that before. And that holds you back, right? That you might take you four, five years instead of four or six years instead of four years to even get through undergrad. I think it took me five after I went to community college, maybe five and a half. Uh, and then you have to keep, keep pursuing that. And then you have to navigate the whole like legal uh going into law school like the lsat right you're how do you apply to law school all of those things that like you know looking back on it like, oh it's easy but going through it at the time it's like this is what i have to you know then you have just there's a lot of hoops there are several hoops and over time there are a lot of there are several opportunities for native students to lose that drive to lose that support system to not uh you know, to find out work doing something else. It's really, it was really difficult to give up a, a, a steady paying job working for the court <laughs> to then say, well, know what I want to do? I actually want to take out loans and go, uh, go to law school and give up this job for three years and then, you know, figure out what I'll do after that. Like that's that, that for anyone, not just native students, right? That's a, that's a calculated decision that might not pan out for everyone. And then also there's, I think there's some internal considerations of, you know, many people see the good work that attorneys can do, but there are several people within native communities and every community really that looks at attorneys and goes like, why would you want to be one of those people? <laughs> right. They don't see the value um, in practicing law. To Stacey's point, many of them are uh, trying to direct more of their energy towards cultural preservation or uh, community efforts that are dire, right? They are dire. We need people to do that work. So there's just, a, I don't think it's the native communities, at least in my experience, is prioritized, like people, putting people to law school. Also the the rural factor, like there's a lot, just the tribes are not located near law schools. So like, you have to make the conscious decision to move away from your community to do that. And it's hard. It's just really difficult because you have to go to a place now where there are a bunch of rich non-native people don't understand you and you have to try to associate and uh you know knowing that you're going to face a lot of adversity and again in addition to what you had to do in undergrad it's just uh it's not a welcoming environment in most cases uh, and then you've got to read johnson versus mcintosh so once you get even to get into law school you have to face these horribly racist opinions that were written in the early you know 1800s um or late uh, late 1700s from our, our Supreme Court, heck, even mid 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 nineteen hundreds, <laughs> um, and like if you know, so even graduating law school, like once you're in, like staying in there for three years is difficult, and then even passing the bar, right? Like you still have to. That's a that's a hurdle. That's I don't know uh, if it's that useful anymore. Um, and and you have to do that, right? So every step of the way, there's opportunities for Native students to fall off, and they do. I've known plenty of people who graduated law school who just didn't pass the bar or like found another job right after law school and didn't even take it. Uh, and so it's really just not getting into it. It's every every single step, we lose Native students to get to that number that seems very very low, but um, it it could really be higher. There's talent in Indian country that I think goes unrecognized, and and we have to do a better job of reaching out to those those students. You know, John, you mentioned that um, a lot of a lot of students don't even graduate high school, and I saw a statistic, a recent statistic, uh, that only seventeen percent of Native Americans pursue education after high school. It's a very low number, and that one in three Native Americans lives in poverty in this country. What are the social and economic factors that? Um, might be contributing to this situation where Native Americans can't get the education that they need, the equal footing um, to move, you know, forward um, in a, in a, you know, with their education. Oh. 
if that's directed towards me, I'll uh, I'm gonna need a minute. I don't know if the other panelists have uh, have some instant thoughts on that. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. I mean, you know, the historical trauma of boarding schools and being removed definitely impacted the Native American community, um, leaving definitely leaving a lot of people behind. Uh, plus, if you don't have, you know, the people who went to boarding schools, the boarding schools focused on training us for the jobs that they determined we should have. So they weren't kind of, they weren't like rich European boarding schools. The, the boys were taught blacksmithing and farming skills um, and, you know, manual labor. Girls were taught um, sewing, cooking, cleaning, and things like that. And in the summers, they were, the Native people were outsourced to do those jobs for free for the local farms and, and people that were living around the area under the auspice of job training. And so when they did finish their education, and I put that, that in the, uh, loosely in quotes from these boarding schools, they came out prepared for a particular role in society for which they were deemed um, appropriate. And it wasn't for a higher education. You know, if you don't have a parent that's graduated um, college, never mind, you know, if you don't have a parent that graduated high school, the probability that you're going to graduate college or high school, it drops. I mean, you all know, you all are educators. You probably know those statistics better than I do. Um, but that's the circumstances behind where we're at. Furthermore, like uh, Stacey Lynn was saying, Native people, you know, they often seek that secondary education later in life. It, on average, the number that I've seen that the average amount of time that it takes a Native person to complete their undergraduate education, it's six years. And it's for a variety of reasons, almost all economic or family or other kinds of obligations, like Stacey was saying within the community, took me six years. And, and so I feel really fortunate, you know, I graduated, I was fortunate. I, I was a good student and had great grades, but I was coming from a community college. I graduated, well, not a community college, a city college. So I graduated from the city university of New York. And so I was, I feel very fortunate to have been accepted to U of M, but it was very isolating to be there. And just to give you a little bit of insight, although I think the faculty is wonderful and I had a great relationship with staff and certainly made good friends, um, out of 900 students, only four self-identified as Native American. And the very first week of law school, I don't know if Cooley has this, but they have a student um, student offices in the basement at U of M like for the Asian Pacific Society, the Black Law Students Association, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there was an office for the Native American Law Students Association. Very first week that I went to law school, someone defaced the NALSA board and wrote the word tokens across the board. There were only four of us I knew exactly who they were talking to. Now, that could have been something that, I mean, that did make me feel isolated, but, I decided to use that as fuel. Every time I was up late studying and my eyes burnt from reading, I closed them for a moment and I saw that word, tokens. And every time I, my friends might have been going out and hanging out on a Friday night or Saturday night, that I would think about that and go to the library instead. And at the end of my first year, when I was standing at the board and all of our grades were were blind. So, you know, you put a number on your test and you take your test and your the grades are posted by your number. And when I was standing by that board that first semester and I saw that I had straight A's, I turned around and I said out loud, not that I knew that person was there, but just in case, I said, who's the token? And I let that moment fuel me, but I could see it destroying someone else. And there's, you know, that's what we face. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on real quick. And yeah, I mean, it, it just doesn't necessarily address your initial question, but uh, to Judge Maldonado's point, the uh, during law school, the law school experience uh, can be very hostile. We had um, New Mexico was trying to be very progressive, right? So it, I think it has routinely has the large incoming largest incoming class of native students, which is like ten. <laughs> um, 
that may be shifting now to other law schools. But um, so if you have a sample size of 10, there was a class that like the most recent class, I, I don't know, it was like 2016, I think when I got in, uh, took the bar and most of the native students did not actually pass that year. If you take a random sample of any 10 students from any law school, you might get students who don't pass it, right? So in my view, I, I don't know, you'd have to do some statistical analysis to see if it was actually, you know, what the meaning of that was, but they didn't pass. And so New Mexico's bar passage rates went down because, you know, overall, they just that year overall, they just did not do well. I think a lot of it was they were switching from their state bar exam to the UBE. So you can look out for that because I think Michigan is moving that route. Um, and so they experienced a decline slightly because a lot of students had had geared their coursework to take the New Mexico bar. And on that, Indian law is on it. It was on it. It was on New Mexico's bar, but it's not on it anymore when you have to take the UBE, right? So they were prepping for a different test and that is likely a contributing factor. Um, anyway, they, they and so the tone for the next entire year was, I don't know what we're gonna do. These natives are messing up our, our rankings, right? They're mess, messing up our bar passage rates. I, like kind of like, do we even want them here? And I'm like, it's just one year guys, like one year and you're ready to like cut us out. Uh, and so for the next year, they did exceptionally well, the students, did better than the than the average bar pass rate. There was no discussion of man; these natives are really bringing up our our bar pass rates. Same with my class; we we excelled. We we every I don't think anyone didn't pass uh, the bar exam as far as the native students went. And still, like, and so it was like we got all the negative press, but we never got any of the positive press. It felt like, and that is not a welcoming environment for for native students in general. Um, I mean, I know we're not the only group that experiences not being welcome at law schools, but, uh, and we would routinely be victimized. Uh, our law professors would get their, their stuff stolen out of their office uh, that were in the federal Indian law program. And um, there was, a, it was just, just not like, just, um, it just wasn't welcoming. And so I, you know, I, I just think it's like a lot of, I, there were several law students, we had, I think a third of our native population uh, in law school dropped out, like they didn't even graduate because of, of, of all those, those factors. So um, I, like Judge Maldonado, spite is a very, very big motivating factor for me. <laughs> I did uh, something similar when, uh, when it came out because they were talking about how like the, the LSAT scores, I had an average LSAT rate, but it was clear like, we were being looked at as like the affirmative action, you know, people. And, and then I would get my grades and I'm like, uh, I don't, maybe not, maybe it might be others, but you're not going to take that because I'll, I'll give you my grades and uh, they're better than yours. So. Hmm. You've all kind of mentioned the need for uh, a bigger population of Native American lawyers. What do you think law schools can do to help create a better sense of belonging for Native American students, what can we do to create that more welcoming environment for Native Americans? What would need to happen? I mean, I was fortunate the year that I went, Michigan had a minority affairs program. It was called the MAP program. And I got to um, go to the law school a week early and take kind of mock law classes with other minority entries. And it was very helpful to, you know, have a window into what was law school going to be like and have, you know, these uh, smaller rooms that were less intimidating to be able to ask the professors questions about, you know, what it was gonna be like and how we could best prepare uh, and maybe ask them in a setting that's, you know, less intimidating. Um, but I think what I really, you know, the, the thing I got about, from that, more than anything, was I made some friends, people to study with, to share um, outlines with, you know, to, you know, just share the experience of it with. I was actually the first non-African American person voted on to the executive board for the Black Law Students Association um, because that's, you know, because of that program, that's where the majority of my friends were. And that was really supportive and helpful. Overall, I had a wonderful experience that, you know, aside from that entry moment, I had a wonderful experience at U of M. The faculty was very supportive, the staff, 
um, you know, I had a professor that, uh, Professor Peter Weston, who was interested in Indian law, who at office hours took the time to ask me questions. And then that left, made it so I felt comfortable asking him more questions. And, it, you know, it ended up being very helpful in preparing me for um, exams that year and, and knowing what to expect. So all of those kinds of things, kindness, uh, generosity with your time and having an environment where you can, you know, meet other people who are gonna have like experiences, that would be helpful. John or Stacy? I'll let Stacy go. She's definitely, you know, definitely close to that experience. I would say, um, making sure that the the conversation happens in your classroom that Native Americans still exist. And I think, you know, we had briefly touched on this um, in our preparation session, but um, when you talk about the branches of government, you need to mention that tribes exist. When you talk about property law and, and Johnson v. McIntosh, that horrible change, case John was referring to, you need to talk about the different mindset of Native people and why they would would react the way that they did and how our values on property are not the same as the westernized view, that we don't, we, we didn't view the land as our property that we owned it because that is something that is here giving by the creator for us to care for and nurture. So the different worldviews that were at play in those types of cases. Um, and, and when you talk about, you know, those uh, cases that hopefully get implemented into the various core classes, make sure that you have the, the native perspective there as well. Um, and, I mean, for me, I didn't mind providing that perspective. I'm a little outspoken when it comes to those types of things, just because of my urge to help educate. But those things are important, especially being a law school in the state of Michigan, where you have 12 federally recognized tribes, um, thousands of uh, Native American citizens. Um, each attorney that graduates from the school and practices in the state of Michigan is likely to come across a Native American client or colleague at some time in their career, whether it's a tribe or an individual, whether it's family law, property, um, criminal law, you know, so just having that conversation is is really important, even if it's two minutes in a class or or five minutes in another class. Um, it's extremely important to to address those things, and and then that helps. I feel like native students um, feel like that um, part of them is being discussed because we can learn as much as we want about. Uh, state law, we can learn as much as we want about about federal law, but none of that applies when we come back to our tribes. Well, I don't want to say none of it applies. Some of it applies, but but when we come back to our tribes, it's tribal law that that we're focusing on a lot of the time. Um, so just making a mention of those types of things, I think, is important, and that's part of what will assist with inclusion of native students in your environment. Thank you. John, anything to add? Uh, not so much. Um, just, yeah, I mean, inclusiveness, uh, you know, the, the things that I would say like law schools can do to uh, be more inclusive of native students and um, so they don't drop out and, and things of that nature is uh, fairly intuitive. Um, if people are being racist in your class, make it so they're not, uh, they don't say, you know, like they try to curb racist comments. 
try to actually you know address like racist behavior right like <laughs> um man yeah if somebody's writing tokens on a, a door try to find out who, who did that right like take those claims seriously like take concerns of natives seriously because i know the administration would take concerns of other people seriously um and a lot of the times the natives were a very small population so we were brushed off but as long as people feel heard and you listen to them uh then you can build a culture that because if you brush them off right it's not it's, it's like tribes native students don't feel equal right they don't feel equal to the non-native students uh, in many situations like they're they're just trying to get out then um like let me let me put my head down and I'll, I'll i'll leave instead of, of being active participants in these uh in the law school community and the alumni program right <laughs> if, if you if you graduate and and here's the thing is like tribe most tribe tribal uh, most native uh, law students go on to do like great things like i mean we have i think outsized representation now proportion to like native lawyers or people who went to law school students in the or law student law school in the uh the interior right now right <laughs> uh we have we have uh we have a lot of native students go on to do things that like um are just very can be very influential in certain roles because of their unique expertise of, of any country. And uh, you would, I would imagine a law school is incentivized to have their successful alumni contribute back to that program. Um, so like there's, there's an incentive, but uh, just be inclusive, just be inclusive and take concerns of, of native students seriously, even though they're small in number. Um, it's not, it's not difficult. Thank you. Stacey, you mentioned um, tribal law. How does, how does tribal law differ, if at all, from the Western system of justice? Judge, you want to take that? Well, I'll let Stacey start because they have that, uh, you have a peacemaking program, don't you, Stacey? Yes, we do. What is um, peacemaking? Well, it's more than what I could give you in a sentence. <laughs> um, it's a, a different, less adversarial way of not only seeking justice, but seeking clarity, um, gaining communication between those where it may have been lacking. Um, we can use peacemaking for really anything. Um, because not everything is meant to come to court. One of my favorite examples that I like to use is you have two individuals that live close to each other on the tribal property and one works days, um, they have another works nights and the dog is barking. You're not gonna go to court over a dog barking, but what, what's gonna happen is these individuals start arguing about shut your dog up, you know, whatever. Um, something like that is totally ideal for peacemaking, um, where you can get them to sit down and communicate with one another. But we've also handled things um, where some might be reluctant um, in domestic violence situations. Um, and you don't always have the victim and the offender in the, in the same group, but what we found with peacemaking is that um, unlike dominant society, our communities are so much smaller and we're going to run into these people either at the gas station, at the park, at a powwow, there's no getting away. So anybody that I see coming to my court, I'm gonna see them again. I'm gonna see them, um, tomorrow or next week, or maybe this afternoon after they leave. Um, so our communities are so tight knit, it's important to, to resolve those conflicts and enhance that communication. Um, when I think about peacemaking in the process of it, 
it's very similar to the Iraq method that you use in, in law school. Um, whereas with peacemaking, we don't sit in a courtroom. We sit around a circle and it could be anywhere. It could be a circle on your screen. I've recently done a virtual circle, but the first thing you do is you, you talk and you discuss values, but then in discussion of those values, you identify the issues in front of you. Um, and where the R is what I find to be different in the Iraq method, because where we don't typically have black letter law and rules when it comes to peacemaking, what we do have is we have our culture and we have our stories. Um, and those are stories that our peacemakers share to help um, to help the participants gain some insight and some knowledge and tie them to their community and culture and show them a way to where they, they can start communicating. Um, and then, you know, how, how does the, those stories and those situations apply to their situation at hand? How do those life experiences that are shared by the facilitator or peacemaker apply to their situation at hand? And then um, the best part is, is that at the end of the, the circle, which sometimes it takes several circles and many hours, um, the participants are able to come up with their own resolutions instead of a judge giving them a find, which we know is not effective, especially when you're dealing with poor communities. Fines are just a way of um, creating recidivism and keeping people in the system. Um, so it's just, to me, I might be a little biased, and I'll admit that I think it's a much better process. Um, it's actually something that I've spoke with exonerees about that have um, as some of you may know, I was in the, the innocence clinic there at Cooley, and um, we spent a great deal of time talking about peacemaking and how if their cases would have been heard in a, in a setting like that, where they would have been able to speak their truth and tell their story, how their lives would be much different now. So, uh, and it's it's not just for um, criminal cases. Um, you can use it for um, child protection matters. Um, our social services department has um, began to get in the process of using that type of method for their family team meetings. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of like the child protection system in uh, state courts and even in some tribal courts. Um, the caseworkers, the parents, um, other involved workers usually meet on a regular basis, but it, it's typically the workers that are saying this what's need to be done and everything like that. But the family and the parents don't really have an opportunity to talk. So using those talking circle or that talking circle type of methodology when having those conversations, um, is, you know, really given a voice to people that didn't have one before. Um, but I think you can use peacemaking at any setting. You can use it at schools when you have disputes. We've had employee disputes where we've used peacemaking. Um, we've had, um, like garnishment objections where you can, you know, have the folks sit down and talk about it. It's, that's really what it is. It's just getting people to talk about it. And sometimes that takes the, the influence of the court to keep a peaceful arrangement, but sometimes we just use our separate peacemakers. Um, we have citizens that come in that might have a dispute with a family member. Um, for example, like a, a state dispute, but somebody passes away and some of the families kind of arguing about who gets what. We've had them come in and just request to meet with our peacemaker to sit down and talk about those things. And if they weren't able to resolve that, that would have had to go through a long drawn out process in probate court. Um, so it's just, we, we have the ability 
as sovereign nations to do things differently. While a lot of our laws um, do mimic that of the state, or um, it, there is still, you know, certain guidelines that we have to stay in to, to be able to enact things like the Violence Against Women's Act and the Tribal Law and Order Act. But we have the ability to do things in a less adversarial way and the benefits of it are tremendous. But I'll be quiet because I could talk to you about peacemaking for hours. Well, so. and I think we should get together and do that. But um, it sounds like it's not a punishment based system like our system and instead it's it's more about um getting to the root the true root of issues and healing human relationships would you agree with that yeah i would say so i mean the idea that you you know we are it's like living in a small town living you know in an indian community and you really can't throw people away and you know sometimes disputes aren't exactly what they seem so might look like it's a dispute over a vehicle or this, that, or the other thing, but it might have deeper roots. Um, so yeah, it can, I think your description is, is perfect. Uh, I, we use, um, I think our, you asked about like tribal law and just generally, I feel like at least my tribe, accountability is absolutely important, especially in a criminal matter. But we balance that out very nicely with looking at the underlying issues as to why the individual came to the attention of the system in the first place. And then we try to offer a path to healing, whether it's through treatment or counseling or some other road, especially in our child welfare cases, but also in our criminal matters. Um, and that's why we embraced a healing to wellness court as a mechanism for dealing with crimes that happen on or near the reservation that have their origin in a substance use disorder. Could you talk a little more about that, the healing to wellness court? Because you've been um, intimately involved in that. Isn't that true, Judge? Yes, I've had a healing to wellness program since 2012. So what, it, and basically it's like a drug court in the state court system. And in fact, we are a state certified drug court program. We're the first tribal program that has the legal authority in Michigan to return a restricted driver's licenses to participants. But so drug courts are a way for people who commit crimes related to a substance use disorder to receive um, diversion. And so instead of having higher charges that usually in include incarceration, they can participate in what some people have described as really intensive outpatient treatment with a judicial bite. And that the result of that is recidivism for people who, and, and mind you, this is not a program that's for criminals that also use substances. And there's a difference and the way you make that distinction is there's a, um, uh, an assessment done by the behavioral health assessments that let us know whether or not a person is appropriate for our programming. But if truly their criminal activity, I'll give you the perfect example of a case I've had probably a dozen times. Somebody is so drunk or so high that they break into somebody else's home and they go and steal a beer out of the refrigerator and sit on the couch and drink it or sit down and play on the person's Xbox. And they're charged with breaking and entering and, and, you know, other things there. And so that is the, that is a perfect case for a drug court. And if a person doesn't have a program like mine, and these are national statistics, the likelihood of recidivism is in the high 60s, 60% 60 or more recidivism rate. But if you complete a program that my, like mine that follows, um, nationally studied best practices for drug courts, that recidivism drops all the way down into the low 30s. On average, if a person completes a program like mine, you're saving the, the taxpayer between six and $12,000 per participant. It is the single greatest criminal justice reform of our lifetimes. It's been so around- So you're saying services support and reacceptance have a much higher success rate 
than incarceration. Well, you said that beautifully, but I will agree with it. <laughs> Duh, right? And yet, <laughs> and I think that's just one of the most uh, terrific things about the tribes that you have the freedom to pursue a better way. And we just seem to be so stuck in our status quo of punishment and then enjoy one of the highest rates of incarceration and recidivism in the world. Um, it's, we have so much to learn from the tribes and it would just be so wonderful, I think, for law students to have more exposure to these ideas and, and better solutions. Um, you, you all mentioned that, you know, very few Native Americans have the opportunity and privilege to, to, to go on to law school and become licensed to practice law. Why do we need more Native American lawyers? I mean, who's attending to the tribe's legal needs now? And, and why, why would you like to see more Native people as lawyers? Well, I mean, we talked a little bit about this when we met before, but, you know, there's 12 federally recognized tribes just in Michigan. There's over 550 Indian tribes nationally, and we have legal needs. My tribe is a little tribe. It's not a wealthy tribe. Um, and to give you just some kind of perspective, uh, the only per cap that we pay our citizens is once a year, right before Thanksgiving, we give them $500 so that hopefully they'll have a nice meal and a good Christmas with their families. That's it. And the majority of our revenues from the gaming facility are invested back into healthcare so that we have things like a diabetes foot clinic. Um, that being said, despite how small we are and frankly, how limited we are in resources, we spend on average uh, $3 million a year in legal fees and, and uh, legal services. And we're constantly contracting with law firms for those services. And, you know, we find that we're better served by people that really understand our communities and our differences because our values are not always necessarily the same. Like when we're looking at, at projects that impact the environment, those are areas when we built the casino, um, you know, we didn't want to just meet the water quality standards that were required. We wanted to exceed seed them. And that might not be something that you would know to look for and understand unless you understood our community's values. And so our water treatment plant on the casino returns the, the sewer water back to you in a drinkable state. And to, to add to what Judge Maldonado said, um, you know, much of the legal work is still infrastructure building, like the Pokagon ban um, was federally recognized in uh, 1994, um, but we're still continuously um, drafting uh, laws or redrafting laws because when we first drafted them, it was like, let's put something together so that we have a law for it, um, but you know it's it's um, it's important to have uh, people that understand the history of the tribe and the culture, in the language. And I say the language because the language correlates directly with the culture and the way that you look at things, um, especially when you're you're drafting things. Um, that inform how we handle cases with our children and with our family or our families. Um, you know, when, when you think about more of the uh, westernized laws and, and things regarding uh, women and children, they were historically treated as property. Um, whereas our children and, and my children, when my children, um, when I look to my stories and my culture, my children actually chose me to be their parent. Um, so um, it's not just that I have a right to my child, it's my child has a right to me to be their parent. So just those different concepts that if you were not a native attorney that, that knows a little about your culture and your language, you would not think about things in that mindset. 
So you couldn't even even fathom or think to create a law or structure or government in that type of way. Uh, and, and I think that tribes do a good job of um, trying to explain some of those things to people when we have them come in to work for us. Uh, previously, pre-COVID here at Polkadian Band, our orientation was about five days long. Um, a few of those days were just history and culture oriented uh, because for we lawyers, wanted people Casey, that, for lawyers that wanted to do work for the tribe, they would go through an orientation. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. it, it depends. Are they in house or outside? Right? Um, but even if they're outside, I think they still work with. You know, our in house to, to have some of those conversations, especially specifically. In the areas that they're going to be doing work for us, um, but yeah, I, I think you know, learning about the people that you're going to work with in the community you're going to work with is important wherever you go, whether it's a native community, um, African American community, Muslim community. You need to know the people that you're working with and for. Um, because we all have different cultural differences and mindsets and um, the way the things that we value um, really is at the foundation of everything that we do. Thank yeah. you. I'll give you kind of like a, a, a really hands on example of why, it, you know, you need somebody that kind of understands our values. When I was working for the tribe as in-house counsel, uh, we paid a half a million dollars a year for an insurance policy to cover us for any kinds of slip and falls or anything like that that might occur, a tort that occurred on the, the property. And we're working with a regular insurance company that didn't really know us very well and didn't understand us very well. And every single time there was an incident that happened, they would go into tribal court and they would claim, they would use the sovereign immunity of the tribe to avoid payment. And we actually had to pass a law because that's not what we wanted. We wanna be good neighbors. We care about the people that we live next door to in our community, regardless of whether or not they're tribal citizens. We had to pass a law stating that we waived our sovereign immunity in tribal court for any tort up to the amount of our insurance policy. Just so you could make things right just so we could be good neighbors because that was our value. But having an insurance company that you know did not understand that, we, we had to write a law to make it clear. Sitting down and talking to them honestly wasn't enough. Oh, well, and of course they have their own agenda of never wanting to pay. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, that there's a, there's an opposite. Well, that's, that's, an inter that's an example of, you know, you need to use your values and all that. But if, if the question is like, we need more native attorneys out there, people, familiar with native attorneys or at least federal Indian law in general um, because tribes are, have unique legal status. And trust me, if you, if you're on the other side of that, um, things won't be bad. Um, <laughs> with the, uh, with the sovereign immunity issue, there was a, I won't mention names, but there was a, the tribe had, had entered in, Bukhagan Band had entered into a contract with a different, you know, with the contracting party and Things went south in that contract, um, COVID related various things, right? Um, and they, that consulting party didn't, or contracting party didn't uh, include in the contract any waivers for sovereign immunity. So um, we had to inform them that tribal sovereign immunity exists. And they kind of went, yeah, we know. And then it's like, okay, well, cool. But the negotiations are going to be a little bit different um, <laughs> because. Uh, Usually when one side can sue and the other can't, um, somebody ends up paying a lot less money in that settlement. So oh, John, don't tell all our secrets, <laughs> but that's it. It's right. It's like, you don't, that that's the kind of thing. It's like, no one wanted to study Indian law. And I'm like, well, if you want, like, like I said, the people who know the rules best win. And if it goes to like the United States Supreme court, that's a different story. But in many of the lower courts, judges want to get rid of these cases pretty easily. So if you can just wave something that's fairly clearly established, you know, you, you win, right? So uh, it's like, you don't want to be caught on the other side of a person who really understands how the law applies to tribes and you don't. 
because um, things don't work out well for you. Uh, the other um, the other example, I'll, I'll give this really quickly, and this is um, someone else's story, but it applies to the Pokemon band, so I'll tell it. The um, this is only going to take a minute, but the uh, we're in the under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, we have to enter into compacts with states and to do, do certain types of, of gaming, class three gaming in particular. And we, which is different than class two, I'm not gonna get into the uh, the distinction of that right now, just know it's different. And we needed to enter into an agreement with uh, Indiana. And at the time it was, uh, uh, Mike Pence was the uh, the governor. And we had just got land under trust and we went to them and said, okay, we'd like to enter in a compact with the class, class uh class three gaming and his response to our leadership was on the advice of his counsel right was i use my gubernatorial veto to deny you class three gaming and we're like we, we figured you'd say that so we're going to uh we we've, we've already begun construction on a class two facility which doesn't require um a gaming compact and the governor looks to his attorneys and goes, or look, looks to our tribe and says, or tribal leadership and says, what's class three, what's class two gaming? And we say, ask your attorney. And he looks to the attorney and the attorney goes, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> um, you know, you all the way up in the governor, right? Of the, of the of various states, right? You, a lack of, of knowledge of tribal issues will be detrimental in some ways to your interest if they differ from that of the tribe. What so, if there's a, a non-native law student who is just really interested in Indian law and might want to practice in this area? Pardon me. Any advice of, of how they could best position themselves? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that law school, I mean, law school teaches you how to think and how to learn things, but there's definitely some law school classes that are better than others. Um, administrative law, civil procedure, uh, contracts, enterprise organization. I think, you know, if you're looking at working for a tribe, any of those kinds of classes, uh, if you're fortunate enough to be able to take an Indian law class, you should definitely do that. Every law school should be teaching an Indian law class. Um, the summers, the tribes often, like every single summer, I hire uh, at least one law clerk. And I know the other tribes sometimes do that as well. And there's different departments. You can work for the court. You can work for the in-house counsel. And clerking for the court, it's a great experience. It's an opportunity to see how the courtroom works. And um, sometimes the law clerks get more of an opportunity to do things in tribal courts than they would in a state court setting. So those opportunities definitely exist. There's a federal Indian law conference that happens every April out in Albuquerque, except I don't know if that happened during COVID, but I know it's back on. And that is a great opportunity for students if they can, um, University of Michigan funded me to go. And I was able to meet people and make connections, which I would not have been able to have done without going to that conference and my career services office, like I'm sure yours, just wasn't going to have the connections needed to help me uh, break into Indian law. That conference did it for me. So. How would a student um, learn more about any clerkship opportunities with the tribal talk. court? <laughs> Turtle talk. <laughs> Turtle talk. Fact, one, just subscribe, just go to it, put your name, put your email on the mailing list and just look at the Friday, every Friday they post job announcements. And yep. that's turtle, turtletalk.org, did you say? Um, it's. Uh, you gonna look it up, John? Yeah. I don't know what it is either. And then I would just also say like, um, even if they just want to come visit a tribe and learn more about it, reach out to, you know, there's 12 federally recognized tribes in the state, like reach out, come visit, come see our facilities. Um, I'm always welcoming of people here at Okagan Band to come, come visit and talk a little bit. Um, Is there the opportunity to observe court proceedings? Are they public? You know, I would let them. And they could even zoom into some of mine. So, you know, they could reach out to Joan and Joan can get them in touch with me. And, you know, I'd make it happen. How about you, Stacy? 
Yeah, I, you know, the only, all of our hearings are public other than our um, child protection cases, but that just, you know, when, when we have students that want to um, participate in those, we just let the parties know and 99% of the time they say they have no objection. So, uh, Excellent. That's great. You know, I, I see a great question in the chat and it kind of almost is a perfect segue into something else that I was hoping we could touch on. Uh, Professor Mark Cooney asks the question, are there any big picture issues or conflicts that the Michigan based tribes have with the state of Michigan, e.g. sovereignty issues or access to natural resources? And of course, this brings to my mind, judge the legislation that that was necessary uh, here in Michigan, even with ICWA in place, the legislation that was passed, I think, what, in 2014, where you were right there standing beside the governor when it was signed into law. Do you want to take that question and, and, and talk about that for a little bit and any other issues that the tribes have had with the state? So, when I first, I graduated from law school in 2000, and I started working in Michigan in 2002. And when I got to Michigan as a lawyer, Michigan was frankly one of the worst states in the country in terms of compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act, which at the time was, you know, over 30 years old. And it wasn't that I think, you know, it is, this took me a while to understand. It wasn't that people didn't want to comply with it. It was that, you know, when they encountered ICWA, they encountered it so infrequently that they just didn't know the rules of the game to go back to to John's earlier analogy. You know, ICWA is like chess. The moves are pretty simple, but it can take a lifetime to master. And so after, you know, spending a couple of years of trying to sue the state of Michigan into compliance and realizing that that wasn't creating any real systemic change, I started working with the state of Michigan to try to bring uh, the state into compliance. And I was really fortunate. There were a lot of really amazing people in Michigan that were having the same thoughts and concerns that I was having. Um, at the state court administrative office, for example, they had gotten a grant to write a bench book for judges on how to follow the Indian Child Welfare Act. And that was pretty amazing. It brought together about 80 stakeholders from across um, Michigan some of the very people I had litigated against, and we were sitting here writing this bench, bench book together, and that was an amazing opportunity. We built bridges and we built alliances through that process that took us about a year. And when we were finished, um, I felt safe enough and brave enough to be like, you know, this is great, but Michigan's court rules are not in compliance with federal law. Could we rewrite that? And everyone was amazing and supportive and was like, yeah. So little subcommittee and that included me, we rewrote the Michigan court rules to bring them in compliance. And then I'm like, okay, well, judges really, they depend on these little forms that they get, these court forms where they have to check boxes and none of them comply with ICWA. And so, you know, I think I helped rewrite dozens of court forms to bring them in compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. And after all of that, I was getting very optimistic. And so I'm like, well, how about Michigan uh, write its own Indian Child Welfare Act where we take all this case law and bring it into the law in one place so it's easier for people to understand. And then maybe look at some things and raise the bar because ICWA is a floor, not a ceiling. And to my surprise, they, you know, they said yes, and they gave me the honor and privilege of writing the first draft of the Michigan Indian Family Preservation Act. And I came back and um, for the next nine months, we redrafted and redrafted it. And, um, you know, I got to testify in front of the legislature. And one of the proudest days of my life was standing behind Governor Schneider as he sat, signed um, the Michigan Indian Family Preservation Act into law. And it's been challenged um, for constitutionality in Michigan, and it's withstood those challenges, and it's the law of the land today. But unfortunately, there is a case that is pending before the U.S. Supreme Court right now that is challenging the constitutionality of ICWA um, just on a kitchen sink of reasons under the Constitution as to why it's not 
not constitutional. Uh, you know, almost everything is has been settled at one time or another long, long ago. Um, but there is one issue that particularly concerns me and bothers me. It's the commandeering clause. Uh, that's something that hasn't been tested at that level. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I could see them striking down ICWA on the commandeering clause. If that does happen, though, the states like Michigan that have their own Indian Child Welfare Act, it wouldn't impact us. So here in Michigan, things would stay the same, assuming that that's the only provision that is found to violate the Constitution. I mean, who knows? Maybe all of it will be upheld. I don't know, but I'm not, I'm not that optimistic these days. So ICWA uh, set a minimum standard for the removal of children an effort to right the problem that had been going on for decades, the removal of children from their homes, um, valuing family and culture uh, above all else. And then the Michigan Act strengthens ICWA, and we went from being one of the poorest states in compliance, would you say, as a result of the legislation that you assisted with to one of the better states? I think we're a model. And, you know, one of the things that you can look to, to for support for that is when the federal government um, decided to finally draft binding regulations to apply to the Indian Child Welfare Act, they actually looked at MIFPA. And, for example, you know, ICWA didn't define active efforts. So, instead, that was litigated over and over and over again. We wrote down what active efforts are and, and what they should be, and it's laid out pretty clearly in, in the law. And so when they were drafting the federal regulations, they looked at that and they looked at a number of the other things that we had done and they adopted them. So we are a model. Yeah, and there's a difference, you know, in past um, legislation or reasonable efforts versus active efforts. What's the significance of active efforts? What's the difference? Well, the difference between active efforts and reasonable efforts. So in these child welfare cases, well, first, let me start by saying we say abuse and neglect like it's one word and it's not. The vast majority of child welfare cases that come before courts are under the umbrella of neglect. I think about 1% are in the physical or sexual abuse category. And as far as I'm concerned, those can stay in the quasi criminal system. That is really what our child welfare system is today. But the balance of cases, those are neglect cases. And in my experience, those include a couple of things pretty regularly. Homelessness or near homelessness, unemployment or underemployment, transportation issues, which is major in northern Michigan, um, and substance abuse, and sometimes mental health issues. And so what active efforts requires is that when you find a family that's struggling, you don't just give them some template um, plan that they have to follow in order to get custody of their kids back. You don't just say, for example, go to treatment. You actually help them arrange to go to treatment. You might provide them with transportation. You might help them identify treatment that has a bed available. If you've ever tried to, you know, as a court that has a drug court, it's actually really hard to get people into treatment. And so helping people navigate those systems is active efforts versus reasonable efforts, which would be like, go get treatment. Yeah, a better way, in other words. A way that's actually effective and does what you're trying to actually accomplish. Right, right. So we've got a few minutes left, uh, about five or six minutes. I just wanted to uh, put out there the opportunity for anybody in the audience that might like to ask a question, please feel free to do so. All questions are welcome. Come on, you guys are teachers and, and students. I don't have a question, I have a comment. I wanna say you guys did a fantastic job. It's good to see things from another perspective um, and hear your side of the story. I mean, you've moved me in a direction towards that and um, inspired an interest for me. Thank you for showing up today and giving us this opportunity to hear 
another side of how the law can actually work. I like the idea of a better way and um, the idea that you guys are moving towards processes that heal and, and promote closer community. Thank you very much. Uh, Jake, thank glad. you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question, if I may, Joan. Yes, please. Um, Stacy was in my class uh, last fall, Advanced Legal Research Michigan Materials. And thanks to her, every term now that we teach that class, we're going to deal with Native American law because it's an important part of Michigan, really. So, I mean, and so I want to thank Stacy for that. <laughs> and yeah. um, I'm just asking if there is something in particular I need to focus on for uh, Native American materials for the researcher in Michigan for Michigan law. I mean, on to the websites. I have the listing of all, all 12 recognized tribes because I think that's important. I'm wondering if there's something out there I might miss. You know, Westlaw does do some um, codification of different tribal law, but also the Native American Rights Fund has a uh, law library. They have the tribal codes and sometimes links or actual the cases for the different tribes. Um, and that's free and available to anyone who wants to reach it. So that might be something that's helpful. But Westlaw does have some on there. Okay. I, I think I have that website. And I'll look at Westlaw stuff to, to double check what they have too. Thank you. Sure. It's it's NARF. Um, it's www.narf.org. It would be great. Thank you. Beef up, uh, you know, have a, have a handy and ready a, a list of resources. And something else the judge suggested that the library could possibly help with. Uh, it was an excellent suggestion that we find case law. Um, involving uh, Indian law, Native American issues for all of our doctrinal courses so that each course has at least one case in its curriculum that raises awareness and, and, and helps educate on this different system of justice and a different culture and something that's just right here and so prevalent in our own state. And I think that's a great idea. If anyone teaches torts and wants an idea, please reach out to me. I have one for you. Yeah, they, that shouldn't be too difficult to find. I mean, the, the U.S. Supreme Court usually takes like what two Indian law cases a, a term, so it's actually outsized proportionally as uh, the, on the docket for the United States Supreme Court. So, yeah, you can they're out there. Uh, Cohen's Handbook of Federal Indian Law is a good source, and then there are several quality now case books of. Uh, of any law out there. Justice Fletcher has one. Justice Anderson, I believe, has one. Um, there's the Lexus has one. Um, several, several quality case laws. Case, case books. Any any closing remarks from the panelists? She Megwetch for you know if you are here today with us, then you care. And I am grateful that you chose to spend some of your time here with us today, that you open your hearts and your minds to share a little bit of what we do. And Chi Miigwech to you, and thank you for all you do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Chi for in the invitation. Uh, and then this is as to an earlier question of like, how do you be more inclusive? Like just, this is it, right? Like inviting natives to speak on on issues like this, and I know that some of the issues that we talked about are not unique necessarily to tribes. Many were, but not us, just and the ability to share our experiences and then for other groups who might be experiencing the same thing, realize that there are others that are going through the same or have gone through the same. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad, uh, glad to be here and I'm glad that Cooley has uh, shown support uh, and recognized the value that Indian attorneys and, and Indian law has to improving society. Miigwech. And I'll just mimic what they said. And uh, Chi Miigwech, thank you so much for inviting me and um, in having this event. And um, I look forward to assisting Cooley in any way that you guys need in bringing more awareness to um, Indian law and issues surrounding that. 
And if any of the staff or students or alumni have any questions, um, I may not have all the answers for you, but I'm always willing to, you know, help you connect with whoever is needed. Um, education is very important to me, like, and um, however I can assist in um, helping educate others on what we do, I I'm very grateful for the oppor opportunity to do that. And no question is ever a dumb question. So if you if anybody didn't feel comfortable asking something in this discussion, you can feel free to shoot me an email and I'm I'm happy to respond. So thank you again. And Joan, Joan and Terry, thank you so much. Well, actually, thank you, the three of you, for honoring us with your presence, your time, your wisdom and insight. I know you've given us all a lot to think about and judge you just keep doing all the great things you are and john best of luck to you in your new position i hope you love it and of course stacy we are sending you all the past vibes for the bar exam and if there's anything that we can do to help you in these final weeks of preparation you just don't hesitate to if you need help with the rule against perpetuities or something <laughs> don't reach out to me but <laughs> somebody here can help. Uh, so everyone, thank you so much. And again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Well, Judge, I'll see you soon. Good job, Joan. Thanks.